Uh, the next speaker is Allison Suarez from New York Hospital of Queens. She did her residency. Your group is clearly still here. <laughs> and um, she uh, stayed on at New York Hospital of Queens after residency and is now the assistant residency director, mostly interested in simulation and procedural type of stuff, uh, education. So um, she's the next speaker. Well, I just want to thank everyone. Um, well, I guess I want to thank Dr. Shaw for inviting me here and for putting all this all together. And I especially want to thank you for slating me right after Dr. Weingart. I'm not intimidated at all. <laughs> okay, so in keeping with today's theme, I probably don't have to sit that close to the And so in keeping with today's theme of uh, being the ultimate diagnostician, um, I decided to talk about mesenteric ischemia, but I'm not sure it's probably the best topic to talk about because you're really not going to leave here being the ultimate diagnostician for mesenteric ischemia. Um, unfortunately, this disease is a very time-sensitive disease, and I like to refer to it as a ticking time bomb in the emergency department, somewhat like aortic dissection and other diseases of the aorta you come across. So we'll start off with a quote. This is from 1926, a physician by the name of Kokonis from St. Mary's Hospital in London, said that occlusion of the mesenteric vessels is apt to be regarded as one of those conditions of which the diagnosis is impossible, prognosis hopeless, and the treatment almost useless. We go forward now 85 years and the same pessimism still exists, unchanged high mortality rates. The challenge of gastroenterology, still a lethal disease in the 1990s. From German literature, if you can read underneath there, not understood or incurable, and it remains a diagnostic dilemma. So looking at some historical perspective, going back to 1853, Burkow, who we know well for Burkow's triad, did some writing on mesenteric ischemia, the first recording of it back in 1853. 1875 brought us the first model of mesenteric ischemia through the ligation of intestinal vessels. And in 1895, the first surgical treatment was done with bowel resection and anastomosis. The 1950s and 1970s brought forward more advanced methods of treatment, embolectomy and geography. And this promised that we'd be able to reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with this disease. Unfortunately, today, mortality rates still hover anywhere from 60 to 80 percent, unchanged from the 1960s. It's a diagnostic dilemma for a number of reasons. Variable presentation. These patients can present with minimal, vague abdominal pain to a surgical abdomen. A wide age group is affected. Think of it, we tend to think of it as a disease of elderly patients. However, beware of that younger patient that you diagnose with gastroenteritis and you pump full of Pepsi and Maalox and Donatol and let them hang out in the ER for a few hours as their bowel necrosis. Uh, the, lab results may suggest, the lab results may suggest an infection rather than a surgical emergency. Again, you get your nursing home patient who you're treating for sepsis, you're looking for a sore, so you wait for five hours for the nurse to put Foley in just to get a urine back that gives you some cheap loop so you can call it urosepsis. Again, your bowels necrosing. There's no specific serological test to allow for early diagnosis. And it's oftentimes considered a diagnosis of exclusion. Our patients come in with abdominal pain, we're thinking pancreatitis, diverticulitis, gastroenteritis, some hepatobiliary disease, maybe small bowel obstruction, maybe renal colic, biliary colic. We don't think of that as a ischemia. Vital signs may be initially normal. As emergency physicians, we're often falsely reassured by normal vital signs when our patients present to the emergency department. The literature on this disease is very, very scarce. And if you, you're not going to get a great evidence-based medicine lecture here because the literature just doesn't exist. In fact, so much that in 2010, the Journal of American College of Cardiology published their performance measures for adults with uh, peripheral artery disease. So all these all these groups, organizations got together, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and then all these other people who I don't even know what those letters stand for, they got together and said, let's see how we're doing. Let's see how we're treating peripheral artery disease, which mesenteric ischemia is considered. And then I'm excited because I'm thinking this is going to be my lecture in a nutshell. And then I get to what they get to the section where they're talking about mesenteric ischemia, and this is what I find. There's even less scientific information on mesenteric artery disease available and thus no performance measures were deemed appropriate for this topic. They don't even talk about it. We're back in 1926. So I have some bad news, I have some good news. Bad news is you're going to miss this disease during your practice. The good news is you're probably never going to know. It's 
going to be a nursing home patient that comes in who you're treating for sepsis and they pass away, an autopsy's never done, and you never know. The true incidence is really unknown. In fact, there was an article published in 2004 which said that the majority are diagnosed at autopsy, and that bumps the mortality rates now above 90%. And in those cases where it was confirmed on autopsy there was mesenteric ischemia, only a third of the time is the diagnosis even considered before death. This is the final common pathway. This is what you want to avoid. This is dead bowel. <coughs> So, what are the culprit vessels? We have the three main branches of the abdominal aorta, the celiac artery, the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery. The celiac artery uh, covers, uh, supplies the stomach, the first portion of the duodenum, the liver, the spleen, the pancreas. The superior mesenteric artery covers a lot of ground. A good portion of the small bowel, two-thirds of your transverse colon. The rest is covered by the inferior mesenteric artery. And there's a lot of redundancy and collaterals as well, but for the most part, this is the distribution. The SMA is the most commonly involved vessel. Portal vein can also be involved. You can get thrombosis of the portal vein, which, co which causes engorgement of the vasculature, um, and then thus uh, bowel ischemia and necrosis. So you got to think of mesenteric ischemia as a syndrome, as opposed to just one disease entity. We left medical school thinking that mesenteric ischemia is pain out of proportion to physical findings. That's the end. That's the answer to the test. Uh, I, the answer on the exam, and that's it. But it's actually a spectrum of a disease. It's almost similar to acute coronary syndrome in the sense that you have your stable, your unstable, and then you have your acute occlusions. I like to think of chronic mesenteric ischemia as your stable angina. These are your old patients who probably smoke, have a history of atherosclerotic disease, and now they're cachectic, they've lost a ton of weight because they don't like to eat because they've developed an aversion to food or a cytophobia. Okay? Patient might look like that. Or maybe <laughs> not. Then you have an acute then you have an acute form of mesenteric ischemia. Your most common is acute occlusive arterial embolic forms. These are your patients with atrial fibrillation because the most common place for the emboli to originate is the heart. Uh, they're probably female as well, and it involves the SMA most commonly, and that's because the superior mesenteric artery takes an oblique angle as it branches off of the uh, abdominal aorta. So of course the emboli are going to follow the path, path of least resistance, and they're going to lodge somewhere close to the middle colic artery, which will mean that less of the bowel is involved, uh, but that's the, that's the vessel that will be involved. Your thrombotic is the most deadly. And this I like to think of as your stable angina becoming your MI. Because these are your patients who have a history of chronic mesenteric ischemia. And these uh, thrombi, uh, I should say these atherosclerotic plaques, they like to develop right where the mesenteric artery branches from the abdominal aorta. So when you get complete occlusion, you're talking about a whole lot more bowel involved, and so a lot more morbidity and mortality is associated with it. Your mesenteric uh, venous thrombosis is like your DVT of the abdomen. This is your least common. These are your younger patients who probably have some sort of hypercoagulable issue going on, factor V leading deficiency, protein CNS, lupus, whatever the case might be. It can involve any of the venous vasculature of the mesentery, but can also involve the portal vein. Your low flow states, this is like your Prince metal angina. These are your patients who have vasospasm of their mesenteric circulation, or they have a low flow state. Your ICU patients who are on vasopressors. Your CHF patients whose ejection fractions are anywhere from 10 to 15 percent. Digoxin is a medication that can cause paradoxical vasospasm of the spine in circulation. And cocaine, we all know, can do the same. So back to the cardiac analogy. We think of a cardiac stress test. Someone gets on a treadmill, they run, they have vascular disease, they start to get chest pain because their myocardium increases the oxygen demand, but their vessels just aren't up for the job. I like to think of the stress test in patients with chronic mesenteric ischemia as a meal. They have a meal, the oxygen demand of the intestines increase, the vessels aren't up for the job, they develop pain. More on a, a specific level, tissue specific level, again, it's time sensitive. The longer these patients don't have blood flow to the intestines, you go from mucosal infarction to transmural infarction. If the demand outweighs the capacity, the tissue necrosis. If the blood pressure is in the toilet, as Dr. Weingart said, you're going to have uh, ischemia to the, and necrosis to the valve. And then if you treat the problem, you remove the clot, you reperfuse the vessels that have been ischemic, you're going to have free radical formation, and that's going to perpetuate the injury to the valve. Severity of disease will depend on the state of circulation. Chronic mesenteric ischemia patients who've 
had disease for a long time actually develop decent amount of collaterals and they actually uh, fare a little bit better than patients who don't. So whatever the underlying pathophysiology is, this is a time-sensitive diagnosis, and again, the end result, final common pathway is dead valve. So what are the red flags? What are, you, what are the things you're going to want to look for in your patients? Well, they're probably going to be female. They're going to have multiple comorbidities, such as vascular disease. They probably smoke. smoke. They may have AFib. They might have a history of chronic mesenteric ischemia. Ask your younger patients about histories of, history of clotting. Uh, any history of valve disease or recent MI. Any intra-abdominal malignancies, pancreatic cancer can <coughs> induce a hypercoagulable state, but large intra-abdominal masses can also compress vasculature. The low cardiac output <coughs> states, any recent vascul excuse me, vascular surgery, and surgery, and any medication history. <coughs> so what are these patients going to complain about? Well, in, for the most part, they're going to have some sort of GI issue, which is why you're most commonly going to confuse it with some sort of gastroenteritis type of picture. They're probably going to be nauseous and vomiting, probably will say that they had diarrhea and now they have constipation. But their, their presentation may actually vary depending on what the underlying etiology is. Patients who have acute arterial embolic occlusion, those are your patients that come in early on because they had sudden onset of severe pain. And then they'll describe, the, describe this gut evacuation. They have like explosive diarrhea and vomitage, which you can see why you might think it's food poisoning. They're also the ones that are going to talk about pain out of they're the ones that are going to present with that pain out of proportion to physical finding. <coughs> mesenteric arterial thrombosis are your patients who've had chronic mesenteric ischemia. Now the pain's getting worse because that occlusion has become complete. Your mesenteric venous thrombosis is going to be a little bit more vague. I had a patient, a young patient, soon after I finished residency, she came in complaining about abdominal pain. She's laid up on a stretcher in fetal position. She barely will let me examine her. Finally, I get her on her back. I press on her belly really not impressed, but she just looks so uncomfortable. So what do I do? I get a CAT scan because I don't know what else to do and she just looks uncomfortable. Turns out she had mesenteric venous thrombosis. Everybody thought I was a genius, but I really didn't know what the hell I was doing and I just got the CAT scan because that was just the next step. At any rate, they're very, don't blow them off. Their presentation is vague. Uh, make sure you get a good history. Um, your non-inclusive patients, again, get a medication history, but if they're ICU patients that you're kind of babysitting in your emergency department, these are the ones that despite being treated, repeat ABGs are showing a persistent metabolic acidosis with a base deficit. They're not improving. And the chronic um, is an abdominal engine of pain after eating. Uh, the pain out of proportion to physical finding that we always learn about is actually absent in 25% of patients. However, this particular article did not specify whether that 25% of patients actually had some other underlying cause for mesenteric ischemia. Most common symptoms are sudden onset of nausea vomiting, that triad of abdominal pain, bloody stools, and fever. It's only present in about a third of patients. So your physical exam, early versus late, is going to determine what you're finding. Vital signs can be initially stable on presentation, so make sure you reevaluate your patient. Generally looking, you want to see how does the patient look? What's your general feeling about the patient? Look for any signs of peripheral vascular disease, any recent surgery that they might have had, do they have any other signs of thromboembolic events? They might appear septic to you. And your patients that come in smiling, waving at you, and then all of a sudden they just, that's it, they crap out on you, rapidly deteriorate, you gotta consider mesenteric ischemia. Another good reason to get an EKG in your elderly patients with abdominal pain, other than looking for signs of ischemia, look for atrial fibrillation and listen for a murmur. Abdominal exam, in patients with chronic mesenteric ischemia, you may hear an epigastric root. I don't think so. You're not going to hear that in the emergency department. I'm not sure why you included it in the lecture, but at any rate, just threw it up there for, for fun, I guess. Acutely, early on, they're going to have pain out of proportion to physical finding, most likely. Rarely are you going to find local signs. Late, bowel will be distended, silent abdomen, surgical abdomen. Dead bowel imparts the smell of feces to the breath. It's not just bad hygiene, it's dead bowel, okay? And the rectal exam, early on, 25 to 50% of patients will have a cold positive stool. Late on, it's going to be gross blood. So make sure you remember the spectrum of disease and always make sure you double up during the rectal exam. Um, it's a time-sensitive diagnosis, 84% during the first 12 hours, 2% after 28 hours. The goal is to diagnose before the bowel infarcts. The most important prognostic factor and the only one that can be influenced by the surgeon remains the time interval between the onset of symptoms and surgery. 
we're the ones during that time interval that are going to make a difference. So how are you going to diagnose this? Well, first and foremost, you have to actually think about it before you, before you can diagnose it. If it's not in your mind, then it's not going to happen. You're going to order some lab tests. You're going to order some serological markers. Traditionally, get your CBC and maybe an ABG, a lactic acid, ESR, CRP, et cetera. You can see how this can be deceiving, and you can run down the, the road of sepsis, especially in your elderly patients, your nursing home patients that might not be able to communicate with you. Bottom line, if they have a leukocytosis or a lactate, it's a poor prognosis. But don't forget your elderly patients who are immunocompromised who aren't capable of mapping white count. There's some serological markers out there, novel serological markers, phosphate, glutathione, transferase, D-lactate, fatty acid binding protein, and procalcitonin. Uh, the, this systematic review that was done in 2009 just basically said our traditional and novel markers don't do a good job at diagnosing mesenteric ischemia. And those studies that were actually done were either animal studies or just a few case series or case reports here and there, just not very helpful. What we're looking for is an intestinal marker, somewhat how the myocardium has troponin. We want to find the same thing for the intestine. But the problem is, is that the intestinal architecture is very complicated. And any proteins that might be produced by the intestine end up getting metabolized by first pass metabolism and not detected in the peripheral circulation. And in addition to that, proteins produced by the liver also are proteins produced by the intestines. It's a lot of crossover. We don't have that early serological test to make this diagnosis. What are you going to get as far as radiology is concerned? Well, the abdominal x-ray, it's normal in about 35% of patients. You might see dilated bowel loops. If there's perforation, maybe you'll see free air on the chest x-rays, the better x-ray for that. And it may help you exclude other etiologies. Ultrasound, you can detect, it shows some promise. You can detect some thickened bowel wall and alias ascites. It's been shown to be useful in chronic mesenteric ischemia. But as always, it's operator dependent. Overlying gas in your patient body habitus can really limit your study. CAT scan. This is going to be the new gold standard for um, mesenteric ischemia. And in fact, a lot of the recent literature is suggesting that all the advancements in technology, especially with CTs, are making this test the better test. Early studies gave us a 68% sensitivity. Now we're up to 96 sensitivity, 94 specificity. Some of the things you might see is pneumatosis intestinalis, which is air in the bowel wall, maybe some portal venous gas. Um, you actually might see the occlusion of the thrombosis. It's always been a good test for venous thrombosis, and you can also see uh, the distribution of collaterals. Make sure you communicate with your radiologists and your technicians regarding what you're ruling out, because administration of contrast for this study is important. The timing is important. And forget the oral contrast. It's not going to add to your study. This is a CT uh, shot showing a um, thrombosis in the SMA. MRI, MRI, I'm not even going to talk about it because it's not applicable to the emergency department. Angiograms were, are the gold standard. It's still considered the gold standard, especially on your boards. When you take your boards, this is the next best step. But it's slowly uh, going out of favor because you need the availability of an endovascular specialist. You're probably going to need surgery anyway. It does have some benefits. There's a diagnostic modality coupled with a therapeutic option. Uh, catheter, intravascular catheter can administer localized thrombolytics. You can do an embolectomy. Uh, you can also provide vasodilation, and it does help to differentiate from non-occlusive forms. Any patient that uh, presents with any suggestion of a surgical abdomen needs to go to the OR. The laparotomy is the way to go because you actually need the surgeon to look through inch through inch through the bowels. Okay, you need to know this, yes. but you really don't need to know this. Uh, this is, anything above the red line is really where you're at. But I'm really showing you this, because this is published from a, a gastroenterology uh, journal back in 2000. This is an algorithm for managing patients with mesenteric ischemia. According to them, the next best step is a CTA. And this is where, this is the road we're going to go down um, so more so in the future with this disease process. And then obviously, whatever the underlying etiology is will determine how they're treated. Treatment, resuscitate your patients. Uh, provide hemodynamic support, intubate if they're obtunded, they're at risk for aspiration. Provide broad spectrum antibiotics, please provide pain management, and discontinue any potential vasoconstricting agents. If they go, whatever, they, whatever the case is, if there's any evidence of a surgical abdomen, they need to go to the OR. Just like time is muscle, time is brain, time is bowel. Um, in uh, the practice guidelines published in 2005, 
based on level B evidence, which is data derived from single randomized trial or non-randomized studies. There's no level A evidence for mesenteric ischemia. Again, the treatment will depend on what the underlying etiology is, but for the most part, these patients are going to need surgery. The level B recommendation is the bowel resection with anastomosis. That's back, this, with this, we're still treating them the same way from 1895. Now they go in for a second look, 24 to 48 hours, to make sure all the dead bowel has been removed. In non-occlusive, you're going to treat the underlying condition. Uh, angi uh, you perform angiography, you can inject vasodilating agents such as papaverin. It's great, it's less invasive, but you don't get to look at the bowel. And again, they'll need surgery if there's any evidence of, of dead bowel. Chronic I'm not going to talk about because it's not necessarily something we're going to treat from the emergency department. And mesenteric venous thrombosis, you're going to anticoagulate them like you would anticoagulate your PEs and your DVTs. So some final pearls regarding mesenteric ischemia. Always maintain a high index of suspicion. Always reevaluate your patients. Do not be reassured by normal vitals. Forget the x-ray, or if you're going to get the x-ray, make sure you bring, it over, bring them over yourselves and make sure it gets done expeditiously. You don't want them sitting outside the x-ray room uh, for hours just for you know, there to be a bad outcome. And forget the oral contrast. It's a waste of time, time delay, and get your surgeons involved early. Thank you. Are there any questions? One question. Oh. I'm sorry, what did you say? You have to get the CT with IV contract, and it has to be, it's a little bit of a challenge because there's different protocols when you're ordering a CT. If you want to rule out a dissection, you have to tell your radiologists, your technicians, I want to rule out a dissection because the timing of contrast administration is crucial. It's the same thing for um, mesenteric ischemia. So it, it is a challenge. You have to know that that's what you want to rule out because you're going to, if, if you don't administer the contrast in that time, in the time fashion that's required, you may miss the diagnosis. Does that help you? Okay. I don't know exactly how much better it is, but the time, I mean, the bottom line is the timing is important. I don't know the exact number of what, how much better it is. Yes? Absolutely. They do use, uh, if you have a patient that presents, they don't have any evidence of surgical abdomen. And they can undergo angiography, and they can um, undergo localized, they actually do localized thrombolytic therapy to the emboli at that okay. point. But if there's any evidence, the bottom line is, is that you never really know if there's any dead bowel. So there, a lot of times, especially if they're ultra conservative, they don't want to go in and do surgery. But yes, thrombolytics are used, and that is a conservative management for this disease, yes. Okay.